Hello, everyone watching at home. Sorry, sorry that you're not here in person with us. You're missing out. I hope you're having a good time away, though. We are going to have this lesson 30 about God's protection, how God takes care of us, especially protecting us from temptation. So students here in class are on page 159 in the book, so you can get there too. It is lesson 30, page 159. Oh, pause the video if you need to. Open up your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 19, and we'll get started. So everyone, we're looking at the sixth petition. It says, lead us not into temptation. Who are we praying to in the Lord's Prayer? God, yep, do you remember how the Lord's Prayer starts? Our Father, in our Father in heaven. So if we're praying the Lord's Prayer and we're saying, God, lead us not into temptation. Don't lead us into temptation. Do you think, do you think that God tempts people to sin? No. Does God ever tempt us to sin? God doesn't tempt us to sin. He's not tempted to sin. He doesn't want us to fall into sin. And Martin Luther kind of thought, well, maybe people thought that's what it meant when we said, lead us not into temptation. So you see the what does this mean in the, the top box? It says, God surely tempts no one to sin, but we pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so the devil, the world, and our flesh, our sinful nature is living inside of us. Do not deceive us. Lead us into false belief, despair, and other great and shameful sins. And though we are tempted by them, the world, our flesh, sinful nature, and the devil, we pray that we may overcome and win the victory. So how does, Jesus, how does God help us in temptation is one of the things we're going to look at. And then we're also going to be looking at the seventh petition, deliver us from evil. When evil does come, God protect us from it, are some of the things we're praying. So let's take a look at 1 Kings chapter 19 beginning with verse 1, and we'll read all the way through verse 18. So we'll just kind of keep going around the room. Kaysen, we'll start with you. So let's just take a verse at a time. First Kings chapter 19. Now Ahab told Jezebel, Jezebel yep. Yeah. Everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all, all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a uh, messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods be with you, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. All right, let's pause there for just a second. Okay, we got to figure out what, where we are here. Um, Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done. Ahab and Jezebel are the king and queen of Israel. And there, he's not a good king and she's not a good queen, two of the worst because they kept on practicing idolatry, they kept on following other gods, especially this god named Baal. And they worshipped him, and they had all these um, prophets and idols and everything. So, do you remember the story of how Elijah had this challenge match with the prophets of Baal to see whose god was real? They had, they had this challenge where it was they each slaughtered a bull and put him on an altar, and then said, pray to your god... And whoever God, whosoever God answers with fire is the true God. So they were all going to pray. And if there was a real God out there, then he was going to send fire and burn up the, the offering, the bull. So the prophets of Baal start, and they start dancing and praying and calling out, and nothing happens. And they keep on doing it, and they're trying to like, God, don't you hear us? Oh, we'll suffer for you. They take knives and like, cut themselves, and they keep on having this, um, this big thing to try and get Baal to answer them, and nothing happens, and Elijah the prophet even, like, trash talks him, and he says, hey, maybe, maybe he's sleeping, better yell louder, and they keep on doing it, but until nighttime, nothing happens, not a true God, and then um, Elijah goes, and he starts taking these buckets of water, he builds a trench around his altar, starts pouring water on it to just soak the bowl that's on the altar and all the wood and everything. And the water even fills up this big trench around it, so it's just soaked. 
And then he prays and says, God, you are the true God. Um, show yourself who is true God so that they know there is a God in Israel. And then God just sends fire from heaven and just boom, just burns up the whole thing. Even the altar that they made, the stones are burned up. The water inside of it just evaporates. Whoosh, is just gone. And then Elijah's like, this is the true God. Israelites, let's take out these false, false prophets that are leading us into sin and idolatry. And then they go and they just kill a whole bunch of the prophets of Baal. So God like, showed up and Elijah should be feeling like, whoo-hoo, God is real. But what does Jezebel want to do when she hears about how um, he had killed all the prophets with the sword? I think you had read that verse, Wesley. Well, what, is, what, is he, what happens in verse 2? What does she say is gonna, she's going to do? It's kind of weird language, but what is, what is she threatening to do to Elijah in verse 2? He killed a whole bunch of prophets with the sword. What's she going to do this time tomorrow? It doesn't say. Read the verse again, verse 2. May the God deal with me. May it ever so severely. If by this time tomorrow I do not make the life or death of one of them. So she wants to make Elijah's life like one of those prophets that had been killed with a sword. Or he, she, wants him dead. she wants him dead. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to make sure that you're just as dead as they are. So she sends a messenger to Elijah. This messenger comes up. Elijah, Jezebel wants you dead. Ah! So you can actually write that in number one, and then we'll kind of we'll go back there. What did Queen Jezebel threaten to do to Elijah? She threatened to kill him. So he's like, hi, hi, hi. God really showed up, showed that he was true God. But then um, Jezebel's like, I'm going to kill you. So let's go on to verse 3 and go from there. All right. Is it, is it Addison who's next? Okay. Dear Sheba. All right, let's pause there and just look at number two. So Elijah runs. He's afraid. He runs for his life. He runs to another city, to Beersheba. This is actually quite a ways south of where he was by Mount Carmel, which is in northern Israel. And then, and then he's just, and then he decides to stop by this bush and pray to God. What does he pray for? I think that's our question, right? What, what did Elijah want God to do for him? Take, life. Take my life. What does that mean? Sure. Let me die. Yeah. Yeah, um, he wanted God to take his life. You can put that for number two. He wanted God to take his life. We're kind of seeing how God is going to protect people from their enemies, especially spiritual enemies. Right now, Elijah has all kinds of fear. He's worried. He's scared. God, I'm done. Just kill me. It's all over. Okay. Um, this is maybe just a, a thought question in here. Why do you think he ran for his life? from Jezebel, she's going to kill me. Oh, no, but then he wants God to end his life. Like, he could have just, if he wanted his life to end, he could have just hung around and waited for Jezebel to do it. Why, why doesn't he want her to kill him? But, yeah, maybe if God does, that'll be better. What do you think? So he wants to, so he wants to have been, like, tortured? Yeah, maybe something like that. Like, she might have done really terrible things. God, how about you just, just bring me to heaven now, okay? Let's be done with this. So maybe you could write in for number three. He was scared of what Jezebel would do to him. He was scared of what Jezebel would do to him. Yeah. But then it's like he's just got all this despair. He's, he's sad. He's overwhelmed. He's just gone running and running and running away, and... And he's just like, God, uh, I'm done. Let's read on and see what happens next. Um, verse 5. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. 
Horeb. Let's pause there, and then we can pick up the rest of that verse in a second. That's kind of cool. Okay, so um, he's 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 just really sad. He's saying, "Ah, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors." And then he goes to sleep. I've had enough. But then an angel comes and he helps him out. Um, how did God show his love and concern for Elijah? What did he What did he do for Elijah? Give him food and water. You could write that down. Number four, he brought food and water for Elijah. Yeah. A couple lessons ago, we talked about preservation and how God gives us our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And, um, yeah. So, here we see God preserving us. Elijah has these enemies that are chasing him. He's done, but God comes and he strengthens him. And then he goes and travels 40 days and 40 nights. Because <laughs> he was strengthened by the food. Now, you wonder, like, did he eat some more food over those 40 days? I, I hope so, but that's probably the start of it. All right. Now he travels. He goes down to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. All right, let's continue verse 9. Want to read the second half of verse 9 again, Trista? And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? You fled out of the Nazarene. Zealous, rhymes with jealous. Zealous for the Lord of the Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down the altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they have found a stone to kill me. Let's pause there. How many, how many people, number five, how many people did Elijah think still worshipped the true God? From that verse. God, I've been zealous for you. I've been passionate about spreading your word, but the prophets have been killed with the sword. They tore down your altars. How many believers are left, does he think, Charlie? It's only me. There's no other believers. They've all been killed. Oh, God, what am I going to do? See, you could write that down. How many people did Elijah think still worship the true God? Only him. Just one. All right, and then we will read all the way through. I think we'll read all the way through uh, verse 18 here. Um, pick it up again right here. Jason. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And Elijah did as the Lord Let's pause there for just a second, then we'll come back to you again. Quick review. All right, so God says, go and stand out on the mountain. The Lord is about to pass by. And then all these things happen. Where was, where was the Lord not? Everything but the gentle whisper. Everything but the gentle whisper. So what were the everythings? Let's list them, three things. We don't have to write this down, but where was the Lord not? Where did he not reveal himself? The wind crept blowing, hurricane force winds coming by, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. What else? Earthquake. earthquake crashing, probably rocks crumbling around, but the Lord's not in the earthquake. And the last one? Fire. The fire, just boom, burning, flaming, but God's not in the fire either. Instead, he's in what, Wesley? The gentle whisper. The gentle whisper. And that's a neat picture 
Because that's how God wants to deal with us, too. Even when we come before him complaining, whining, thinking, Oh, no, I'm the only one left. Life is so terrible for me. The way God always works with us, he doesn't come to us with the rock-smashing, powerful wind of... He doesn't bring people to faith like that either. He doesn't like, boom, slam, you're a believer now. Instead, God comes to us with a gentle whisper. A gentle whisper of his word that says, look at my son, look at my son, Jesus. He came to rescue you. He came to save you. You're not alone. He's with you and there's more believers out there too. That's how God always works with that gentle whisper of his word, those little things that don't look like much powerful, but that's how God comes to us. Can you think of two ways that God comes to us, things we've learned about in catechism class, that don't look very amazing, but God says they're super powerful, and they give us strength and forgiveness and life? Can you think of at least two things? Maybe you could do three if you repeat one I just mentioned. Things that don't look very powerful, but God uses it to do huge, amazing things. His word. His word. That's one of them, right? By the power of God's word, tells us about Jesus, washes away our sins, makes us his child. So the word and the two other things, ways that God strengthens our faith, forgives our sins. No, not the big, powerful, amazing miracles, although it is a miracle, but it doesn't look like much. Happens in church. Some of them happen every couple weeks. Another happens eh, maybe every couple months or so. Happened three times in a row a little while ago. Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper is one. Lord's Supper strengthens our faith, forgives our sins, and we might think, that's not womb-bang super powerful. It's just bread and wine, but it's not, because through God's word, it's his body and blood for forgiveness. All right, what's the other one? You're on the right track. I bet if you got the Lord's Supper, you can guess the next one. Baptism. Baptism. Water. A little sprinkling of water. Not that amazing, is it? Yeah. When it's connected with the gospel, when it's connected with God's word, then it washes away our sins and gives us life forever. All right, so God comes to Elijah, gentle whisper, Elijah, what does it say here? It says he pulls his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. So sometimes people are like, masks, how could you wear masks in church? God's people shouldn't have to wear a mask. Covering your face in God's presence was actually a sign of worship in the Old Testament. So, yeah. You know, we'll deal with what we have to deal with for now. But Elijah covers his face with his cloak, goes up, and goes to meet with God. Let's see what happens from there. Did I stop at, at you again, Trista, or Addison? Who's up? And I don't even know what verse four. We must be on the verse 14, maybe. God just said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Oh, I just read that. You just read that. Okay, so we're on to Charlie. Charlie, verse 14. Dear God, I have been very bad for the Lord God Almighty. Did you notice that? We've read that one. Yeah. He says this earlier. He said that back in uh, mm -hmm. verse 10, too. So he comes and he says, I've been so zealous for you. And you read it last time, too. I've been so zealous for you, God. And then God's like, hold on. I'm going to come over here and talk to you. And then he repeats it. So go ahead and repeat it. Keep on going. Verse 15. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. Damascus. When you get there, I have no <laughs> idea. I'll take over from there. Right, okay. Doing? So when you get there, so he's going to give him this list of things to do, and these, are, these things are going to happen later. They're not super important to know right now, but I'll, I'll read the crazy names here. All right. So go back the way you came. Go back to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. So this is like an enemy nation, but God is going to use this Hazael guy to um, take over some of the evil going on in, in Israel. 
also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, because God is going to take out this bad guy, um, Ahab, and anoint Elisha, son of Shephet, from Abel Mehulah, to succeed you as prophet. So we've got these two prophets, Elijah and Elisha. And Elisha is going to be kind of the follower of Elijah, and he's going to take over for him. So he's going to get that started up. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael. Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. So God's, he's like, oh no, Ahab and Jezebel are going to kill me. And God's like, no, I know all that's going to happen. I'm going to send this king to go and take over here. And then he's going to take out one guy. And if he doesn't get them all, here's another king who will help out. And even the prophet will help out. I got this. And then, um, Charlie, would you read verse 18? Not Charlie, sorry, Wesley. Verse 18. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, although to all, all who leave heaven bow down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. All right, so e Elijah said, I'm the only one left. There's no more believers. God said, yeah. There's more believers. There's actually quite a few people who haven't bowed down to Baal yet or kissed his idol statue. How many? How many believers are there still? A lot. 7,000. 7, yeah. So number six here. How did God encourage Elijah? He revealed there were 7,000 believers. He revealed there were 7,000 believers. Yeah, Elijah was tempted to think he was the only one left. He was tempted to despair and give up and think God didn't care. But God came to him in his word and said, Don't worry, have courage, be encouraged. I've got this under control. Sometimes we're tempted to, tempted to sin, tempted to turn away from God, tempted to think, ah, oh, he doesn't care about me. How does God help us when we're tempted? We'll look at that in a second. Let's see, what does, what does it mean that we have temptation? What is temptation? So go ahead and grab this sheet out. And lesson 30, so page 2, I'll give you a second to make sure you have that out. I'm going to do a check on one of our guys here. and 15. You can each take a verse. All right. We're tempted when we're dragged away by our own evil desire. So a temptation is like the devil dragging us away into sin. It starts with a desire. It starts with a thought. And then the thought gives birth to sin. And if sin just keeps on growing inside of us, where does it lead according to that verse? Temptation, desire, sin, and death. Yeah. So it's pulling us towards sin, these temptations. Okay, let's go to 1 Timothy 9 and then over to Cason for 10. Some people eager for money and have 
wandered from the faith and pleased themselves with many deeds. Yeah, temptation is a trap that leads people into sin. So, um, number or for verse ten, there does it say that money is evil? Is money evil? Yes. Take a closer look. Does it say so money is? The love, of money. the love of money is evil. What's the difference between money being evil and the love of money being a root of all kind of evil? Yeah, right. We can use money for good. We can give money back to God. We can use it to support our family, to let us do some fun things too. But loving money and thinking that's where I'm going to get my security, that's how it's, that's a temptation. That's a trap. And it kind of leads to all kinds of evil. And again, what has happened to some people, according to verse 10, when they're really eager for money, when they're just thinking about money more than anything else, what's the most dangerous thing that's happened to some people in verse 10? wander away from faith yeah yeah they wander away from the streets of gold in heaven where they'd have treasure for eternity so that they could just have a little bit more of something now how sad so what is temptation we have a couple pictures that we've got one temptation is being dragged away by our desires it's falling into temptation like a trap like a bear trap that just snaps around us here's what you can put for the key term temptation Something that pulls us toward sin. You can write that in that box on page 160. Something that pulls us toward sin. A temptation pulls us toward sin. So we said how Elijah was, was maybe tempted... When he was worrying so much, what were some temptations he had? What do you think he was tempted to think about God or God's plans when he was so worried that he was the only one left? Kill me now, God. What do you think, Wesley? That he's special. I'm the only one. So on the good side of it, oh, I'm special. But he was like, ah, just kill me now. I'm the only one left. Maybe he also thought, what about God? If he's the only believer left in the whole world, what does that mean about God? Does that make God seem very strong? No. No, maybe he thought God's plans weren't working. Maybe he thought God wasn't. Maybe he thought God's plans had failed. You could write that in number eight, that God's plans had failed. He was tempted to think that. But then God came to him in his word and said, no, they haven't failed. We learn a little bit more about temptation from James 1, verse 13. James 1, 13. Who's up for that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what, is, what does that verse tell us about temptation? Where does temptation not come from? God. Yeah, you could write that in there. Temptation doesn't come from God. Temptation doesn't come from God. We'll look at three verses that give us three places temptation does come from. It's not from God. God isn't tempting us. You getting that written in there, Wesley? Temptation doesn't come from God. Pencil got stuck in there. Well, I'll give you a new one, and then maybe you can even use it to push out that one. Or use this. Yeah. Temptation doesn't come from God. Where does it come from? Let's check out some of these Bible verses. First one is Revelation 12, verse 9. So there's this great dragon that is hurled down. He's going to be hurled down to the earth. This is kind of a picture of when Jesus comes back at the end of the world and wins and just takes him out. Who is it talking about when there's this great dragon who's, who leads the whole world astray? 
Who's that tempter who leads the whole world astray? The devil, Satan. Yeah, and it just says that. That ancient serpent called the devil. What story does that make you think of when you hear about an ancient serpent called the devil who leads the whole world astray? Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve yeah. And in the Adam and Eve story, it doesn't say the devil. It just says serpent. But then you get a passage like this. It's like, of course the Bible identifies that serpent, that ancient serpent that leads the whole world astray as the devil. So who is one person that tempts us? The the devil. You can write that as one of the things in, in number 10. Number one, the devil. The devil tempts us. We have the story even of Jesus when he starts his ministry. He goes out in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights and the devil is there tempting him. And Jesus never once gives in to temptation at the devil from the devil there or any time. Okay, 1 John 2, verse 16. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. All right, everything in the world, lust of the flesh, like the things that we just want in our heart, the eyes, the pride of life, this stuff doesn't come from the Father, it comes from the world. What is, what is the tempting thing in this verse? says it twice. Mm -hmm. The world. That can be number two. The world. What are some ways that the world or things in this world can be tempting for people? If you were to use the word tempting, like wanting, wanting something that you shouldn't have, leading you into sin... What kind of things in the world could be tempting where you maybe think, ah, oh, I want those even more than God? Love of, love of money was one that got mentioned, right? Yeah, that's definitely one. Maybe popularity or something like that. God, please help me be popular. But sometimes you're not popular when you speak the truth or are a Christian or something like that. Yeah. And then sometimes we'll say, well, maybe I won't stand up for another person if it means my friends aren't going to like me as much. So there's things in the world, the people around us, that can lead us into sin. Or maybe it's just the friend group that you're hanging out with and you know that, ah, this isn't the best group to be around, but they can lead you to fall into sin too. So the devil, the world. And then, last one, Galatians 5.17. So we've got this battle going on inside of us, and the Bible uses different words for it. Sometimes it talks about the spirit, it's talking about the spirit and the flesh. Some other ways the Bible talks about this are the, the new man and the old Adam, or the sinful self and the new self. Every Christian has inside of them two parts. They still have sin inside of them. Sometimes the Bible calls it the sinful flesh. It's just like those thoughts inside of us that are, aren't coming from anywhere, but inside our own hearts that just say, I want to do what's best for me. I don't care what God says. And we've got the good guy inside of us, the Christian part, saying, stop it. I want to do what God says. I want to do what I want. There's this battle going on inside of us. Um, there's this phrase, it's an old Latin phrase, about the Christian, and it is this. Um, I know there's, there's at least one pastor out there I've heard of who has it um, printed on his bice tattooed on his biceps. <laughs> and it's simul justus et peccator, which means at the same time, sinner and saint. Actually means at the same time, justified and sinner. But we are all two-part people. At the very same time, God sees us and he says, you're holy, you're perfect, you're everything you need to be because Jesus washed your sins away. But I'm not perfect and holy. I keep on sinning. But God says, I see you as perfect and holy, but we keep on sinning. So at the same time, we've got this struggle going on inside of us. And that is called our sinful nature. So for number three, you can write our sinful nature. 
So God doesn't put temptation before us. Who does? The devil, the world, and our sinful nature. The devil, the world, and our sinful nature. So what should we do when we're tempted to sin? Psalm 50, verse 15 Awesome. Any of you guys have this one for your confirmation verse? I don't think so. Right? Some people use this, seventh graders in the room, seventh graders watching online. This is a good verse for confirmation too. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. You will honor me. What should we do when we're being tempted by the devil, the world, and our sinful nature? Um, Call on God. Yeah. Pray to God. Ask him for help. Um, let's see, yeah, pray to God for help. Let's put that for number 11. When we're being tempted to sin, what should we do? Pray to God for help. Got some other good examples from the Bible too, like uh, uh, Joseph when he was in Egypt and Potiphar's wife kept saying, hey, come into my bedroom and he ran away. Sometimes we need to flee from temptation. Get out of the room. Hey, want to try? Want to vape with me? No thanks. I'm out of here. Mom and Dad won't notice if we just drink a little bit of the tequila in the, in the upper um, cabinet or something like that. They won't notice. Run away from it. No. Um, okay. 1 Corinthians 10.13. What does God always promise when temptation comes to us? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Is that you, Wesley? No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. All right. So what does God promise? He will help us endure temptation. He will help us endure temptation and help us stand up under temptation. He's going to be there with us. He's going to hold us up. And when we do fall, he'll be there to forgive us and take care of us. Are you going to say something? Yeah, it means like standing up underneath a heavy weight. It's like a, it's like a picture of a, a bodybuilder who just maybe whew, lifted up the barbells and then they're sitting there uh, enduring is when they're standing there with it. Like, I'm not going to fall down. It's so heavy, but I'm not going to fall down. And God's like pushing up and giving you strength to hold it up. Endure. So God's there with you for that. Let's look at our chart. Temptation. Yep, so we've got, just to kind of talk through a recap of what we've already done, temptation is any situation in which we are led by the devil, the world, the sinful nature, not by God, into these things. False belief, despair, kind of like Elijah, oh, I'm the only one left, God, don't you care about me? Or other great or shameful sin. These are things that, the, that Martin Luther uses in his explanation to the article. And then what can God do? Keep the temptations away and help us overcome temptation. That's what we're praying for in the sixth petition. Help us so we're not overcome by these temptations, situations that might lead us to sin. So the next article is, um, so lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So we're asking God to help us when evil comes into this world. Number 13 says temptation is one form of evil, but evil threatens our lives in other ways. Let's pause there. What are some ways that evil happens in our world? Murders. Murders. Suicides. Suicides. Sometimes that happens with the despair and thinking, oh, nobody cares about me anymore. This is, this is too much. Yeah. Mass arson. Mass arson. Lighting everything on fire. Wesley is doing good on listing evil. Anybody else know some evil things? Peer pressure to do uh, like drugs and stuff like that. Peer pressure to do drugs and stuff like that. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Evil. Yeah. Wars. Fights. Violence. Even just things like, yeah, online multiplayer mo mode. <laughs> Temptation to either hang around when people are using filthy language on games or join right in with them. Something like that. Things to stay away from. All kinds of evil. So evil threatens our lives in lots of ways. Being a mafia boss. Being a mafia boss, yep. Yeah. God promises to take care of us when these bad things come into our life. Read Psalm 91, verses 9 through 10, and let's see one way God protects us from evil. So, Psalm 91, verses 9, and then verses 10. Verse 10. All right, so they're saying, the Lord is my refuge. The Lord is going to take care of me. If God is with us, then no harm will overtake us. So one, one thing God can do to protect us from evil is just God might keep the evil away entirely. So you could write that down. God might keep the evil away entirely, like a big old force field around you. God just keeps the evil away. This is my child. No one's going to mess with him. That doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes God does. Just keeps the evil away. That's one way God protects us from evil. We can pray for that. God, keep the evil away from me. Another way God protects us, Romans 8, verse 28. Okay, so God takes all things and works them for the? Protection. Protection is good, but uses one other word. What's that? Good. For the good. God uses all things for our good. So here's what you can write in number 14. He promises to work good even though evil touches our lives. He promises to work good even though evil touches our lives. If you take a look at that verse again, I guess I'll let you write that down. He promises to work good even though evil touches our lives. How many things does God promise to work out for our good in that verse? All things. All things. Whoa. Even the bad things, even the sicknesses, even, even the pain, even when you get caught for doing something that's wrong and disappoint a lot of people, God can use all of those things and will use all of those things for our eternal good. Yeah. That's evil is touching us. That's why we're supposed to be six feet apart. You're supposed to be six feet apart. But even when it gets close, God can even use these things for good, and he does. So he can keep evil away from us. He can use evil to bring good into our life. Psalm 94, verses 17 through 19. Looks like we need to turn the page. And go through those verses. I think it's Kaysen, right? Mm -hmm. All right. You want me to read the entire thing? Yeah, let's just do one verse and we'll go over to Wesley. Yeah, even when the anxiety was high, God comforted him and brought him joy. Even when he thought his foot was slipping, I'm, I'm falling away, God's love was with him. Even when he was, you know, soon going to be dying, the Lord gave him help. So here's what we can write. Another way, um, God protects us. He uses evil things to remind us. This is number 15. He uses evil things to remind us, 